10th century, the years from 900 to 1000, although I'm going to uh, make a little incursion into the 11th century because the character that I'd like to focus on is someone you've all heard of, and some of you may be familiar with his thought. Not many people are familiar with his life, but his name is Anselm. And so we're going to be doing a little bit with Anselm, sometimes called Anselm of Canterbury, because toward the end of his career, he turned out being uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, one of many luminaries to hold that position. But I'd also like to finish up a little bit of our discussion last week in which we were talking about the beginnings of the Holy Roman Empire. I'm not overly interested in the Holy Roman Empire. It doesn't have a huge amount of bearing in terms of uh, my interest in church history, but it is at least helpful to know what it is, where it came from, because it forms the backdrop for a fair amount of the careers of certain people that come along. You may know that, for example, the Reformation, in which Martin Luther was protesting against abuses of the Catholic Church as he saw it, this is all happening in the Holy Roman Empire. And in fact, at the Diet of Worms, which was his last opportunity to recant his teachings, one of the assembled princes there was Charles, who was the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And again and again it pops up, so I thought it'd be helpful to at least do a little bit to make sure we have some sense of what that political arrangement involved. But as I say, my main interest this morning is Anselm. Anselm spent a few years of his life on the run. This is when he was a teenager, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, but as I was reflecting on his life and his career, I was trying to think of what would be a text of Scripture that might be descriptive of some of his experience, and my mind went to Psalm 36, so I want to use that as the, at least to some degree, uh, background biblical setting for his life. I don't know, I didn't have any indication from my reading on Anselm's life that this was one of his favorite psalms, but I'm going to suggest to you that if it wasn't, it should have been. So if I ever have a chance to take that up with him, I'll ask him about it. But I suspect he was probably familiar with it, and it wouldn't surprise me if he might have saw, seen himself in it if he had uh, occasion to do so. So let's, let's look at this. This is Psalm 36, a psalm of David, and really quite descriptive of some of the experiences that Anselm had as well. Psalm 36, the Word of God. Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in their hearts. There is no fear of God before their eyes, for they flatter themselves in their own eyes that their iniquity cannot be found out and hated. The words of their mouths are mischief and deceit. They've ceased to act wisely and to do good. They plot mischief while on their beds. They're set on a way that is not good. They do not reject evil. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. O continue your steadfast love to those who know you, and your salvation to the upright of heart. Do not let the foot of the arrogant tread on me, or the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the evildoers lie prostrate. They are thrust down, unable to rise. So I'll refer back to that a little bit later, but we'll just leave it at that for now. Let's uh, have a word of prayer. We'll get going. Our Father, we're grateful for your constant mercies to us. We thank you for these characters that have been used by you so significantly in the unfolding story of your people. And we pray now that as reflect, we reflect on this man that you used in such a strategic way, Anselm, that we would be inspired and encouraged by 
thinking about his life and the contribution he made. So we give you thanks for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Just a little bit about the 10th century and the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire, as I was mentioning to you last week, is created really at this time. And it continued for some hundreds of years to be the dominant political presence in Central Europe, occupying largely the region that we would now call Germany. It really begins with the character we mentioned last week briefly, who was called Henry the Fowler. What I neglected to mention last week and may help you understand what's going on is this is really the moment when feudalism as a kind of social approach to life was more or less hitting its pace. With Charlemagne, you still had a pretty strong central government, but after Charlemagne, Louis the Pious, his son, and then certainly after him, the three sons that more or less divvied up the pie, all of them permitted a high degree of decentralization of authority, and so you begin to see this kind of patchwork approach to governance in which you've got land barons, you've got fiefdoms, you've got all of these various kinds of uh, aspects of a feudal society, and the guy who's at the top doesn't have autocratic control. He's not an absolutist ruler, but he's kind of like herding cats, you know, and he makes this arrangement with various lords and earls, etc., within the feudal system in exchange for a certain degree of protection, and that was the kind of thing that was going on, and that was really what brought Henry the Fowler that we talked about last week to the position of leadership. He was elected to that post because he had had demonstrated military capabilities. He was able to resist incursions by the Huns who were coming in from the east. He was also able to expand the borders of this region and so on. So he kind of functioned as a king of sorts. And then that brought his son, who was Otto the Great. The big difference between Otto the son and Henry the father is that Henry didn't care much about the church. He wasn't hostile to the church but he just had better things to do in his mind. And so his relationship to the church was more or less distant and detached. Meantime, what's happening in the church during this era is rather significant. You may recall that Pepin, the father of Charlemagne, had created for the Pope a kind of kingdom called the Papal States, in which the Pope now was not only a religious ruler, but was also a political ruler. He had his own little kingdom. And that does seem to begin a process of secularizing the way in which the Pope viewed himself, and that did cause a gradual deterioration, I might, in my opinion at least, of the kind of moral high ground that was otherwise held by the leadership in the church. So that by the time you get to Otto the Great, the Pope is really viewing himself really as much as a, a, a political leader as well as a religious leader, and that causes a strange kind of metamorphosis in some ways of the way in which the church is being viewed, and Otto appreciated that. Otto was a smart politician, and he recognized, unlike his father, that he could play the church to his own advantage. And that's exactly what he wanted to do. And so, in this kind of strange relationship that began to develop between a political character such as Otto and the Pope, who was sort of political and sort of religious, Otto saw his opportunity. And so the way this happened was uh, to create then this kind of vast political entity that was called the Holy Roman Empire. And so Otto himself is the character who's associated with that. It was his term. He's the one that used it first, and it stuck for many, many years, up until really the reign of Napoleon, who reasserted his imperial power as over against the Holy Roman Empire, dissolved it, and declared himself the emperor of Europe. All through those hundreds of years, the Holy Roman Empire was out there and having some significant influence in European history. Otto is the first character who is fully Germanic to take the term Roman, Empire, uh, Roman Emperor and apply it to himself. The last Roman Emperors had been way back in the Roman era. Then we have Charlemagne, who received that title from the Pope. The difference between Charlemagne and Otto is that 
at least in my opinion, Charlemagne was a true, devoted Christian man. Not everything he did was thoroughly Christian, but I think his heart was in the right place. You know, that's my assessment, for whatever it's worth. I think he was trying to do the right thing, and however history has judged him, I think there's been a general consensus that that was true. And so whatever errors he made along the way, which is obviously, a, you know, a kind of a peril that you're in when you're in high political office, nevertheless, he seems to have been doing it with a sort of sincerity of heart. Otto, not so much, in my humble opinion, you know, but uh, Otto is really uh, kind of doing what he can to make the church his pawn and to serve his purposes and advance his political agenda. And he recognizes something about the church at this point that would not have been the case so much at the time of Charlemagne. And that is that the church has this rather political aspect to it and is therefore susceptible to political pressure and political maneuvering. And so Otto begins to play on that and form this sort of interesting relationship with the Pope in which they're going to more or less support each other to the uh, great advantage, as it were, of Otto at this point especially. He's able to unite the German world, this region out in the middle of Central Europe under one king, but as I say, it was a rather decentralized kind of rule. It was really feudalism uh, in, at its highest expression at this point. But nevertheless, he's the guy that's generally regarded as the emperor, and he has that role at that point. And he uses the church as his tool to advance his authority. So just a word on this. The church was still, in the popular mind, the most credible institution in the world. The church had, for some hundreds of years, been the social glue. And if you needed food, if you needed shelter, if you needed clothing, if you needed education, if you needed medical care, if you needed any of those things that we tend to associate with kind of the benign side of social service. You know, you'd go to the monastery, you'd go to the church. And the church also seemed to have this great moral authority. It could speak, as it were, for God. And so people at the popular level held the church in extraordinarily high esteem. Otto recognized that. And he wanted to get some of that capital that belonged to the church into his corner so that people would kind of view him as having that imprimatur that could only be given by the church. And so he really does maneuver himself in a way to try to appear to be the great champion of the church, and he's able to manipulate the Pope sufficiently to get the job done, so much so that in 962 he's crowned by the Pope, under a fair amount of political pressure on the Pope, you see, the emperor. And then Otto takes the term and applies it, the holy Roman emperor. And that does score him some points because people begin to get that kind of confused vision, you see. And in my opinion, I think Otto was doing that strictly out of pure uh, kind of political instinct and genius rather than any sort of heartfelt interest in things truly related to the church's concerns. The later years of his career were tumultuous. He had an ongoing conflict with the Pope, which was largely political, as to who's really in charge here, you know, that kind of thing. He also had some problems with the East, because the East had an uninterrupted tradition of a Roman emperor, going all the way back to Roman days. And they believed the true emperor of Rome was in the East, in Constantinople. And so for another guy to pop up and say, I'm the Roman emperor, gave them a little bit of heartburn. And there was some concern whether war would erupt between the two sides, the East and the West. Otto wasn't interested in that. But nevertheless, it did create this kind of tumultuous instability that eventually would lead to the split between East and West. We haven't seen that yet. We'll talk about it a little bit more at a later time. But also gives rise to the backstory, in a sense, for the Crusades. And so all of this is kind of going on beneath the surface here, and we'll save a little bit more discussion of that for another occasion. But just be aware that Otto is, in a sense, kind of in a, 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 a he's having to use an awful lot of his good political instincts to survive some of these difficulties. When we get to the year 1000, here's essentially what the Holy Roman Empire looks like. The black lines, of course, demarcating it. So you've got 
this blue section in the middle. Off to the west, you have what eventually is going to be called France. At this point, it's the Western Frankish Empire. Off to the east, largely Russia and that region, which is uh, still more or less uh, in a different culture altogether. But notice also that he extends his control down well into Italy, well past the region controlled by the Pope. So the papal states are more or less enveloped now in this broader rule that's being wielded by Otto. And this is part of what gives rise to the tension between Otto and the, successing, uh, the, the succeeding rulers uh, and the Pope and, and create some of the political tension that's going on there. So that's as much I want to say about that, probably more than you wanted to hear, but I just wanted to keep that kind of uh, in the back of our minds as we go along. The, Roman, the Holy Roman Empire remained a loose federation under a kind of feudal system of German states. It remained so well into the, well into the uh, early 19th century with Napoleon it was kind of reconfigured later as what was called the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They, together with Germany, of course, became the principal political characters responsible for the First World War. And all of this had its roots way, really going clear back to these ancient sources. So uh, this became a dominant and important uh, part of the story. All right, enough of that. Anselm, next century, really, we're in the 11th century here, although I'm still officially thinking of 10th century events. Anselm was born in 1033. You've all heard of him, I suppose. Anselm is his first name. He's got a long Italian name. I thought I'd just spare it to him. He's about eight names long, you know, so I'm going to not give you that. But uh, his first name is Anselm, and that's the way we typically refer to him. He was born in a little region called Aosta, which is right there at the very northern tip of Italia. And it so happens that right there at the very north of Italy, you're right at the foothills of the Alps. It's a beautiful place. And Anselm grew up in lovely, lush uh, surroundings, and just off in the distance there were the Alps. And you would think this would be almost paradisical, but for Anselm it really wasn't. He grew up in a home that was ripped apart he had a mother who was a very devoted Christian and was very much concerned that Anselm be instructed in Christian truth from his earliest days, but his father was, we would say, alcoholic. He was violent, he was abusive, and so the home in which Anselm grew up was one that was disrupted constantly by the tension between these two. And Anselm himself writes later about how often he felt he had to flee for refuge to his mother against the violent threats of this father, especially when he'd been drinking too much. You can all imagine what kind of home situation this was. And some, however, in spite of the tumultuous family life in which he was reared, seemed to, from his earliest days, have had some deep sense of God. And his mother, of course, did everything she could to reinforce that and encourage it. And he tells a story which is about a dream he had, and it obviously had such an impact on him that years and years later, he would still reflect on the significance of that dream that he had when he was about seven years old. So this is quite a remarkable thing, that he has this dream, and it's so vivid that he, even throughout his life, wasn't sure if it was a dream or a vision. But he's about seven years old. He'd been instructed by his mother that God lived, as she put it, on high. And of course, she probably meant in heaven, but the seven-year-old Anselm assumed when she said on high, she meant up there in the Alps. Because you look out and you see those beautiful mountains, kind of like the ancient Greeks thought that Zeus lived on Mount Olympus. This young boy, Anselm, thought God must be up there in those mountains. And he always had this desire to go on a long hike up some path and reach the home of God. I mean, who wouldn't want to do that, you know? Well, he tells the story of going to bed one night and having a dream, and in this dream, he pictured himself taking such a hike. And he goes on this long trek, walking, 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 and as he's traveling along, he passes people who are laboring in the service of God but he notices 
that they are for the most part lazy, irresponsible, um, dishonest, and that probably was something of what even the young Anselm had seen in the culture of the church by that time. Remember, he's in Italy. He's not far, relatively speaking, from the center of the Christian world, the Pope, the, the, the Papal States, but the effect of kind of the deterioration of papal moral authority was being felt even in that region, so much so that a boy of tender age would notice it. And so in this dream, he sees this, and he thinks to himself, I'm going to tell God about these people. He may not know, you know, that, uh, that these folks aren't serving him with the same integrity that they should. And so in his mind's eye, in this dream, he makes it to the place where God lives, beautiful, he's ushered in, and he's so struck, as he describes it later, by the beauty, the glory, he forgot all about reporting these ne'er-do-well servants of God that he'd experienced earlier. He describes being brought into the very presence of God, sitting at his feet and having a long conversation, having all of his questions answered, and then God summoned a servant to bring in some bread. And he describes it later, he said it was the whitest, warmest, most delicious bread he'd ever tasted in his life. Seven-year-old boy, you know, and he just was flooded with a sense of the blessing of that wonderful bread. And then he's dismissed and he comes back and, of course, wakes up in the morning so impressed with this dream. And he tells it in detail to his mother, who's quite bemused by it. He tells it to his father, who is utterly dismissive of it. He tells it to some of his friends, and they, of course, also treat him to ridicule. And so the whole thing has this rather strange emotional experience attached to it. But nevertheless, it seems that that did stick in his mind and for some reason, for a long time, uh, had an influence on his thought. Anselm's mother died when he was about 12 years old. And so he lost this safe place in his home. And now he is strictly under the control of his father. And his father is not a stable human being. He's quite abusive, quite violent, and never satisfied. So Anselm describes in his later writings, he gives us some of this, how hard he worked to please his dad, how much he wanted just the slightest recognition that he'd done something well, he never got it, and the abusiveness seemed to become increasingly more severe and threatening until finally, at age 14 or 15, right along in that range, he ran. And so Anselm uh, had this uh, childhood dream, but then he fled home as a teenager, probably 14, 15 years old, and he is for five years, wandering from pillar to post out in what was the Holy Roman Empire and over in the Frankish Empire as well. As well. He couldn't give you a map of where he traveled. I just drew this to kind of illustrate the point. But it was not safe to be out as a teenager just you know, wandering around, and this was a very imperiled time. He was always at risk of being apprehended by some local land baron and just turned into a serf to work the land. That could have easily taken place, being reduced to a kind of virtual slave. That was always a possibility. So he always had to have a certain degree of alacrity in his movements. He had to be a little bit uh, under the radar and so on. And, and so for five years, he's just traveling around, watching out for himself, getting odd jobs as he can, whatever he can do just to, just to make it, you see. So you can imagine how much of an impact that had on his life and how much he remembered that time when he used to have his mother, you know, that, that that was gone, home is gone, all of these things that are the props of his sense of security are gone. When he was 20 years old, he wound up at what's called the Abbey of Beck, which was actually in Normandy, and I've indicated on the map there about where it would be located. Normandy, you recall, we talked about last week, was founded by the Vikings, the Danish folks who came down and in an agreement with Charles the Simple, you remember that from last week, Normandy was created, and so it had been there now for about 100 years, it was 9-11 when it was created, and now we're about 100 years later, and Anselm shows up 
at this abbey that had been built there uh, by a, a knight whose name was uh, Beck. This is uh, what it looks like today. I don't think that structure was there at the time. Beck had been founded uh, by a Norman knight of the same name in 1034, so about the time that Anselm was born, 20 years earlier, this abbey was created. This Norman knight wanted to create an abbey that was not simply kind of like a monastery, just a place of, you know, uh, sort of religious devotion. He really wanted to create an academic center, and so he uh, acquired a library and did everything that he could to try to make this a kind of center of learning. But his great coup came in 1042 when he was able to hire one of the most esteemed scholars in the world at that time, a man named Lanfranc. And he was uh, widely regarded as maybe one of the greatest Christian scholars of the day, and Beck was able to bring him in. So about 10 years before Anselm showed up, this Lanfranc becomes the major teacher there at the Abbey of Beck. Uh, he's celebrated in church history. Most of us haven't heard of him because he was eclipsed by his most famous student, Anselm. But nevertheless, Lanfranc was quite an important influence on his student. And uh, this is a statue of Lanfranc at uh, Canterbury Cathedral in London. Anselm arrives about 10 years later. So in 1053, at the age of 20, we have Anselm showing up just, you can imagine, five years on the run. I don't know if he'd had a bath, you know, in recent history. He was, his clothes were obviously disheveled. His entire situation would make him look like someone who shouldn't get anybody's attention for very long, just kind of riffraff. That would have been, I suppose, the appearance but he shows up, as he had on many occasions at many places, just wanting a handout, just wanting an odd job to do, something like that, not really anticipating any further prospects. But when he arrived there, Lanfranc himself, who always took an interest in, in such characters who would show up, sat down with Anselm and had a conversation with him and was immediately impressed that in spite of the external appearance of this young man, there was something under the hood. And he, the more he talked to him, realized that there was quite a genius in this, in this young man's insight, that he certainly had a Christian background way back there, that he had some apparently deep faith that had more or less stood with him. And so Lanfranc himself is quite impressed and begins to put some degree of pressure on Anselm that he should stay there at Beck, that he would be safe in this environment, and that in fact... And some should consider becoming a monk. I haven't talked much about, you know, how this whole movement of monks and so on developed, and I'm not going to say much about it now, except to say that the whole notion of a Christian family, a healthy Christian family, was kind of a lost idea at this time in history. Family was not held in high esteem. The more holy life was a celibate life. I think you're aware of that. There's reasons for that. And so the view was that if you really wanted to devote yourself in a kind of serious way to the service of Christ, you'd become a monk or a nun or something like that. The man in history that really does kind of reestablish the vision of a Christian home hasn't been born yet. Does anybody have a guess? Who do you suppose is most famous for really reinventing the Christian home, healthy family life, married life, changing diapers, loving your wife, having a happy... Who is the guy that really makes that whole vision of a Christian family famous? And his name is, anybody know? Martin Luther. That's right, yeah. Marrying Katie Van Bora. And he sent out a little note to all of his friends. There's to be a marriage between a monk and a nun, you know, and, and the two of them married and had a happy... And that really was the beginning of a whole new vision, but it hadn't happened yet. And so Anselm wasn't really thinking in terms of marriage or any such thing. He wasn't so sure he wanted to be a monk, but under Lanfranc's influence, he finally agrees to do that, and he takes the uh, oath of a monk and so on and enters into that career. About 10 years later, Lanfranc is transferred by William, who is the king of the Normans and known to you as William the Conqueror. William transfers Lanfranc from... Back to another 
uh, abbey, a little bit uh, more strategically located, because William himself is anticipating that he is going to be extending his rule into England. He believes it's his by right. There's a complicated reason that he has that view, and I'm not going to get into that right now, but he believes that he has a right to rule in England as one of these Danish rulers in, no in Normandy now. He believes that agreement has been made to him, and he wants to take along with him the most esteemed Christian leader of the time, Lanfranc, and make him the Archbishop of Canterbury. So William is already kind of, you know, putting his ducks in a row and getting ready for what will be the famous invasion by William in 1066. This is 1063 right now when we have uh, Lanfranc transferred and in kind of universal acclaim, all of the monks and the people who were in service there at the Abbey of Beck just insisted that Anselm be the next abbot even though he was only 30 years old, much younger than you would anticipate such a person would have such a uh, privilege. But nevertheless, uh, uh, he accedes to that uh, request. And so at 30 years old, he became the abbot of this. Uh, and, and it was partly just the, the combination of his clear genius as a understander and teacher of the Christian faith and also his very conspicuous, heartfelt devotion to Christ and his purity of heart and so on. All of that, he was just a very, very widely respected young man, even though he seemed to have so little experience even after these 10 years. So he takes that role in 1063. Uh, I don't know if that's a very good depiction of him, but it's the best I could come up with. He wrote during these years, the next uh, 10 years or so, he wrote and he taught. The two most famous productions that he uh, came up with uh, were called Cur Deus Homo and the other one is Proslogion. These are all readily available. Uh, you may not borrow this book, but I just wanted to show you it is out there and it's readily available and for uh, good A students in this room, I would strongly recommend, you see, that you uh, read a little bit of Anselm. It's good for your soul. And these two are probably his most famous works. It's not easy reading, but it's also not impossible reading. He writes in a very engaging way. Always keep in mind, books that rise to the level of classics become classics for a reason. The commentaries on the classics are typically much more difficult to understand than the classics themselves. And so avoid the commentaries, read the originals. And in this case, I think you'll find it's quite engaging and inspiring, really. So I'm going to give you about one minute on each of these. The temptation would be to launch off into a summary of these, but I'm going to uh, resist that. Curdeus homo literally means why God-man. This is Anselm's theological slash philosophical defense of the Council of Chalcedon. You may recall Chalcedon affirmed that Christ is truly God and truly man, vera homo, vera deus. The church had an instinct as over against the heresies of the day, back in the, you know, 451 when that happened, that our salvation hinges on Christ having both natures fully expressed in one person. It's a deep mystery how that can be the case. The church has never apologized for the mysterious aspect of it, but frankly acknowledges. It's not contradictory, it is mysterious how Christ can be two natures in one person, and the instinct of the church was our salvation depends on that. But there'd never been a good, solid defense of just why. So we have an instinct for that, but Anselm really takes on the question, why God-man? Why is that essential? And he gives us what came to be called in church history the commercial theory. The reformers largely embraced this outlook, but changed the metaphor from a marketplace to a courtroom. So instead of a commercial theory, it became a justice theory or a satisfaction theory. But the fundamental idea of Anselm remained pretty much accepted across the board in church history. And to put it really, you know, just simply, too simply, really, it's something like this. God created us with a duty to glorify him, to honor him, in our slightest infraction of that duty, we incur to God an infinite debt because God is infinitely glorious. And so in the least violation of our responsibility, we now owe him this incalculable debt. Jesus seems to say as much when he talks about a servant who owed a king 10,000 pounds. You remember that? 
that would be enough to pay off the national debt. I mean, that's a huge, incalculable, virtually infinite amount of money. And Anselm says, that's what we owe God, with our slightest sin, let alone how much we've compounded the felony in our lifetimes and so on. So we owe this, we can never pay it. In multiple eternities, we can never pay it. The only person, in fact, that could pay that debt to God would be God. But God doesn't owe the debt. It's human beings that owe the debt. And so Anselm reckons that the one that pays the debt has to have the same dignity as God and yet has to stand in the place of man because it's man who has the obligation. Why God-man? Because it takes both, you see, to purchase our salvation. It's called the commercial theory. I've done it a grave injustice by describing it so briefly, but if you take time to read it, you'll appreciate his genius in working that out. The other is called proslogion. This is sometimes called the ontological argument for the existence of God. Anselm was always possessed of a deep inward sense of God. It goes clear back to his childhood and the experiences he had, part of which I was describing to you, and that was always fascinating to him. Not just the evidence of God in nature, which was important enough, but the evidence of God in our own hearts. In this sense, he's in a deeply Augustinian tradition. And he believes that it's that sense of God, that core reality of God at the heart of human thought that gives rise to the possibility of reason itself. The only reason we are rational creatures is because there is notion, this notion of God within us. God is that being than whom no greater can be conceived. That this is the heart and core of it, and I evaluate all of life by that central core truth. And Anselm says, in some ways, not only that that sense of God within us is a proof that God is actually there, but it is also a proof that everybody believes he's actually there. And the ontological argument does both. Paul says as much in Romans chapter 1. When they knew God, they refused to acknowledge him. Not that they should have known or could have known or might have known, but when they did know, Paul says. In other words, according to the Apostle Paul, there are no atheists. They're just people who refuse to acknowledge what they know to be true, you know. And Anselm takes that idea and really develops it powerfully in this so-called ontological argument called by him the proslogion. So, two very inadequate descriptions of those two, but if you ever have a chance to read those, you'll find them uh, enjoyable, I'm sure. Anselm himself, I think going back to his own experience as a young man, was always quite interested in young men who would come for an education. I'm sorry this was such a male-oriented society, that's just the way it is, you know, I can't. So, uh, I'm sure there were young women out there, beautiful spirits as well, but for some reason the focus in these institutions tended to be on the education of men. And so Anselm was quite interested in these guys who would come, and he was very interested in reaching them at the opportune moment to train them in a way that would kind of send them on a course in life that would maximize their possibilities. He made an interesting statement, this is a quote from Anselm, a youth is like a piece of wax. Uh, if the wax is too hard or too soft, it will not receive a perfect image when pressed with a seal. So it is with the ages of men, old men, present company accepted, of course, old men, untrained in the truth of God, are like hardened wax. Young boys, unable to understand spiritual things, are like soft, liquid wax, incapable of receiving a seal. But the young man, by that he meant guys from the age of about you know, 15 to 22, kind of that, that time frame. Uh, young man is, uh, is pliable. If you teach him, you can shape him as you wish. Knowing this, I watch over the young men with great attention, taking care to nip all their faults in the bud so that afterwards being properly in, uh, instructed in the practice of holiness, they may form themselves in the image of spiritual men. That was kind of his vision. He was an instructor. As, as much of a genius as he was, he never left the classroom. He always wanted to be in that one-to-one -one connection to his students, and he was very much engaged in their lives and very aware of them and, and a, a deep participant in their training and so on. He was kind of a marvel of his day 
for the positive effects of his educational regime. There's an uh, interesting story that uh, he himself tells later of an abbot who came from a visit, uh, was visiting from a nearby um, abbey or a, kind of a, a school as well, and he showed up, and he was complaining to Anselm about the incorrigible, obnoxious, rebellious young men under his training that had such a bad attitude. And he sort of envied Anselm because he looked at these young men and they saw that they had such a ready interest in learning and he wished he could have students like that, you know. And Anselm told later, he says, I, I asked the abbot, well, how do you train these, these, these fellows that come within your school? How do, you, how do you instruct them? And the abbot proudly said, well, I whip them. And when they don't do their lessons right, I beat them and I slap them. How else do you treat, teach these young men? And they're so incorrigible, they deserve it. And Anselm famously responds, he says, let's say you planted a tree and sort of brought the tree up with the same kind of treatment that you're describing with the, what, what would you expect? And the abbot thought for a minute and realized the tree would be gnarled, it would be you know, really a poor excuse for whatever the tree was supposed to be. Because what do you do with a tree when you, you nourish it, you fertilize it, you love it into health, right? Don't you do that? And then he has these young men, vastly more valuable than these trees, and he treats them just with these awful kinds of abuses. And Anselm told him that if he would love these young men, if he would appreciate them, if he would guide them, if he would actually invest his heart in them, he might find some different results. I don't know if the abbot actually took that counsel, but one thing to notice about Anselm was how far ahead of his time he was, because the average school in that day was very abusive, very harsh, and yet he had a very different kind of at attitude toward instruction. And I do think that went back to some degree to his own experience as a young man himself, feeling imperiled by the circumstances of his home way back when he was a kid, by the circumstances of his life out there, you know, just, just trying to escape detection and, and so on. He always was looking for a safe place and rarely felt that he found it. And I think he wanted to create such a safe place and have some sense that people could come to his place of you know, living and education and so on and feel secure. There's another interesting story that he himself tells in which he was riding through the forest with some other monks from the abbey and as they were riding along they heard some dogs, wild dogs, out in the forest barking and all of a sudden, bolting into the path in front of them was a rabbit, obviously being chased by these dogs. And the rabbit, in a complete panic, ran right beneath the horse of Anselm. And it's just right there under, you know, the, the four legs of the horse are its only protection, and it's quivering there. And, and, and the other monks that were with him just burst out laughing at this ridiculous little creature trying to escape the terror of the dogs by, you know, hiding under this horse. And Anselm says later, tears just sprung to his eyes because he saw in that little rabbit himself and how often he had felt that those, and he, he, he corrected the monks. He says, you know, this little creature has come to us for refuge and you laugh at it. And then he said, how many people have come to us for refuge? and we've laughed at them. I think he thought of himself. And it was Lanfranc, you see, who recognized in such an unlikely character as this Anselm, five years on the loose, something worth cherishing. And the monks kind of stopped their laughing at that point. He did help them with their attitude. But that was really something of his character and something of his uh, heartfelt desire to be involved in God's service. This was not the end of his story. Um, in 1066, as you know, William did invade England. He believed he had been double-crossed. The new king in England was Harold. 
we'll, now we don't know, I don't, the backstory here is conflicted at best and there's a varying of views, but William at least maintained that he had been promised the crown through a connection of various kinds and so on. So he felt that he'd been double-crossed and that at least for him was legitimate reason to invade. So the Norman invasion of 1066, and he's successful, of course, defeats Harold at the Battle of Hastings at that time and becomes the king then of England as well as of, of uh, Normandy. He immediately called Lanfranc to become the Archbishop of Canterbury, which was something he'd already been greasing up for some time. That was his plan, and so he made good on it. Lanfranc was himself a widely uh, respected Christian leader, and this was a great move on William's part. And it does seem that William had some kind of genuine faith. I'm not going to compare him to Charlie Maine. I don't think he had that kind of integrity, but he did seem to have at least some deep respect for the church and so we'll give him that much credit. But he certainly appreciated that the Christian population in England wanted strong, good, moral leadership, and Lanfranc certainly seemed to fill the bill. And so for a time, there was within England a recognition of, an appreciation of, the leadership within the church that was offered by Lanfranc. As it turns out, William died in 1087, and a much inferior son of his, Rufus, became the king thereafter. I don't think the artist liked him very much, but uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's the image that we come up with him. Lanfranc himself died only two years later. Rufus was cut more out of the mold of Otto the Great, uh, a guy who wanted to use the church more for his own personal gain than through any deep sense of responsibility for the moral guidance of God's people in England. And it seems pretty clear that Rufus himself was no Christian. He was just a politician. He was really in it just for what he could get out of it. And so he insisted on appointing in the church in, in uh, England basically bishops and so on who were corrupt and who were basically in the back pocket of the king. So it was really implementing a sort of systematic corruption in the church at the time under Rufus, not under William. And so that takes place from that point on. Uh, Anselm happened to be there at the time, and the people were so outraged that eventually they demanded that Anselm himself, who by this time is a very well-known leader of the church, be appointed to the role of the archbishop in the place of Lanfranc. Anselm wasn't so sure. He didn't like Rufus very much, and he wasn't so sure that this was his calling, but nevertheless, the uh, tide of public opinion forced him. He had a stormy relationship with Rufus. He had a stormy relationship with the son of Rufus, the first of the Henrys. So you got Henry I, the last Henry, as you may know, Henry VIII, right? There was never a Henry IX. And this is the first of those Henrys. Neither of these guys were very virtuous. And so whatever Anselm may have had as former insecurities, he threw them away. He met these guys fire with fire. He confronted them, he publicly criticized them, and that was a risky thing to do. On two different occasions, he was exiled, uh, basically put in prison. He never broke, he never, uh, even in his older age, of course, he was stalwart in maintaining that the church should be separate from this political kind of intrusion. And so the last years of his life were really characterized by a high degree of courage as he met what appeared to be the rising corruption of the church that was beginning to influence things uh, there in England. He was buried eventually in 1109 was the date of his death. He was buried right next to Lanfranc, his master at Canterbury. As far as I know, that's uh, where he is. But if you go to Aosta, the city of his birth, you'll find this statue there in honor of their uh, favorite son, uh, St. Anselm, who was born in their little Italian villa uh, so many years ago. My uh, Sunday school thought for you this morning it cut, takes us back to um, Psalm 36. And I just want to read parts of this again and kind of remind you a little bit of how Anselm certainly would have seen in this something of his own experience. The psalmist writes, Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in their hearts. There's no fear of God. How many times had he dealt with that kind of attitude among those all through his life, no fear of God. They flatter themselves. Their iniquity cannot be found out. This is the psalmist, of course, dealing with those who are hostile to God and hostile to his faith. And what is the psalmist to do? This is Anselm. You see, faced with similar kinds of pressures, what's he to do? And it's us. 
because every one of us moves in a world in which we are not always surrounded by people who love the Lord Jesus Christ as we do. And Jesus himself says, in this world you'll have tribulation. It says, if the world's hated me, it'll hate you, you know, and to the degree we're identified with Christ, to the degree we are de identified with Christ, we expose ourselves to the hatred of this world. The world doesn't get it, you see. And Anselm knew that, and we know that. Your steadfast love, however, he continues, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. If Anselm read this psalm, which I know he did, he had many of them memorized, I'm sure this was one of them, he may have thought of the Alps and the righteousness in those mountains rising in such a great evidence of God's glory. Your judgments are like the great deep, listen to this, and save humans and animals alike, even little rabbits scampering through the forest, even little kids like Anselm on the lamb, on the loose, just trying to escape detection. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. He was always fascinated with, by the idea of refuge, a place of safety. The cities of refuge in the Old Testament, the Abbey of Beck, which was for him a place of refuge, his mother, so many years ago, a place of refuge. And how much we, of course, appreciate that safe place that we find under the shadow of his wings. Your continued steadfast love to those who know you and your salvation to the upright of heart. Do not let the foot of the arrogant tread on me. I have to believe Anselm would have read this thinking about his relationships to Rufus and Henry. Or let the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the evildoers lie prostrate and are thrust down, unable to rise. So it's two messages here. One is that we are surrounded by threats, and at the same time we have a place of refuge. And that gives us great hope, does it not? It gives us a great sense of God's care and providence for rabbits, for Anselm, and for us. Amen. Mm -hmm.